Well, I, sh I should say I'm, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this uh, this talk. It, it's uh, it's very uh, very much at the centre of CIE and the sort of, sort of fundamental issues that uh, CIE deals with and uh, in many different contexts. And uh, Uli looks at um, uh, complicated situations to do with economics, uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence, all, all sorts of areas in which we might try and uh, apply logic and computational methods and algorithms to making uh, uh, decisions and evaluations. And uh, this is something that invades our life at many different levels. And, and um, I, uh, we, we argue about this, it's controversial, uh, and uh, Uli actually knows something about it, and he's going to, going to tell us something. He's uh, he spent a number of years in, in London, worked with Dov Gabay, and, and uh, uh, been at Imperial College in London, and now he's, he's been in Amsterdam for around uh, eight years, I think, which is a very kind of uh, congenial kind of location to do this sort of research. So I'm going to hand over to him uh, straight away and, and uh, uh, use the time as best we can. Thanks. I have a microphone. I think it's working. Yes. So um, I want to start with a note of thanks and an apology. The thank you is to the uh, program chairs for inviting me, giving me a chance to talk to you about what I think is a great topic. And the apology is uh, that I will not talk exactly about the things that uh, are announced. So I said I would talk about collective decision making in combinatorial domains. This is an important topic in an area called uh, computational social choice. and I. Uh, kind of yesterday when I saw how things were starting here, I thought it's better if I spend some time on the more general topic first and explain that to you. Uh, and then there will be a few examples of how computer science is used in this area, and one of them will be this combinatorial uh, domains business, the last one down there. So um, maybe not all of you know what social choice theory is. It's uh, usually considered part of uh, economics, like game theory or decision theory, and it's specifically about how do groups make decisions together. Uh, so, for example, when you're taking part in an election, when you're voting, then you're using a collective decision-making method, you're using a method of social choice, and this field that studies the properties of these mechanisms and says what's possible, what's not possible, and so on. And in the last 10 years or so, computer scientists got very interested in this, and this, the kind of the two things are getting mixed up, the economics perspective and the computational perspective. And you see some of the keywords, I will say something about logic, I will say something about complexity, I will say something about knowledge representation uh, in this talk. Uh, I would start with an example uh, for those of you who don't know this uh, kind of stuff yet. So social choice theory is that the most typical example is that you have some agents, there are five of them here, they have preferences. Uh, in this case, they have to decide what do they think is best, blue, yellow, or red? And actually, they have to order these three things. And uh, these five of them, they give us their opinion, and we have to aggregate this information somehow and decide for ourselves what is the correct collective order over these three items, blue, yellow, and red. And um, you can imagine there are probably several methods that you could use for that. And I will just, as an example, show you what's maybe the most obvious, simplest one. So we could go with the majority, right? So we could, for example, say, well, let's compare maybe blue and yellow uh, and see what's, hap what, what's happening there. If we have blue versus yellow, there's expert number one and three and four. They all think that blue is better than yellow. So there's a majority for blue against yellow. So if I had a pen now, I would take a note and say that blue is better than yellow. So we're going to keep that in mind. Uh, now I'm going to compare yellow and red. Um, two first ones, yellow, uh, they like yellow more than red, and then there's one down here who likes yellow more than red. So again, there's a three to two majority who like yellow more than red. So I'm going to note down that yellow is better than red. And actually, so far it looks like the first expert, blue was better than yellow, and yellow is better than red, and actually we're done. Right? We can uh, put these two things together, and then we can see that the, the right collective order must be like the ordering of the first experts up there that uh, blue is the best, then yellow, and then red. And so this is one method that you can use to aggregate these preferences. And uh, it's, a, it's a kind of using a very basic principle. Majority, we, we use that every day um, you know, in, in our various democracies that we live in. It's, a, it's probably a good method. And we end up with something that everybody should be happy with, that that is the right order, that blue is better than yellow and better than red. And then I hope that at this point, some people start moving around nervously in their chairs and say, maybe that's not quite how it should be. So what's the problem with blue being better than yellow than being better than red? 
Yes. Yes, indeed. So if I'm checking blue better than red, and I told you the first expert, we can kind of keep that as a reminder of what our collective order was. He does in see, in, indeed think that blue is better than red, but then actually all others think that red is better than blue. So it was not a very good method. So something strange happened here. Sometimes people call it a paradox. Sometimes they call it the Condorcet paradox, because a little over 200 years ago, the first guy who noticed this problem and wrote about it, maybe somebody else noticed it before, but he noted, uh, wrote about it and people paid attention, was the Marquis de Condorcet, an intellectual around the French, uh, active around the French Revolution, who had these kind of examples and said, well, if we use the majority rule, it can create cycles. So even though every individual expert is rational and gives us a linear order over the three items, if we aggregate using the pairwise majority rule, we end up with a cycle like we see in this picture here. And this was kind of, uh, well, in, in these kind of examples, they're a little bit the starting point for social choice theory. So using, you're using a rule that seems obvious, obviously the right thing, and then you're ending up with something strange and you try to explain it, you try to uh, understand whether you can do better. So can we do better here? Can we maybe think of another rule that doesn't have this weird problem that we're using it and we're ending up with something that's not even a preference relation anymore? So people were thinking about this for, for some time, for a couple of hundred years, and in the beginning they were, you know, they just came up with other rules and uh, that worked maybe well for that example, and then the next guy said, well, but then you have this other kind of problem. And around 60 years ago, it was uh, Kenneth Arrow who looked at this in a more principled way and really started this uh, as a scientific enterprise, and he proved what is known as uh, uh, Arrow's impossibility theorem, that in some sense it's impossible to solve this issue. And what does, it, what does he mean by this being impossible? He means the following. So suppose we're trying to design a method for aggregating preferences like we saw in this example. So you have some alternatives. People give us linear order, tell us uh, how much, you know, what's the order in which they like these items. And we have to aggregate this information somehow and we don't want to have some funny thing coming out in the end. So he wrote down some what he called axioms, some formal properties that he would like to see satisfied, two of them and I'll explain them now. The first one is unanimity. Unanimity says that if I'm looking, for example, at A and B, and everybody, if they unanimously say that A is better than B, then also in the output, at the social level, we should say that A is better than B. Right? If we all agree that A is better than B, then yes, what we decide should be that A is better than B. I think that's fine. Everybody can, can accept that, that we should indeed have that. The second one is a bit more difficult to understand, IIA, independence of irrelevant alternatives. It says that suppose we're looking at a particular situation, a profile, everybody has given us their preferences, and we found out that A should be better than B in the output. Maybe some people said A better than B, maybe a few said B better than A, but we somehow decided A should be better than B. And now we're going to make a small change to this profile. We're going to, for one of these guys, we're going to move C a little bit, maybe up but we're not going to touch that person's relative ordering of A and B. So we have changed something about this irrelevant alternative C, but we haven't done anything about A and B, then we should still have A better than B. This is what this axiom says. Another way of putting it uh, would be to say, if I want to find out whether A should be better than B, it should be sufficient for me to look at what do people say about A versus B. I should not have to look at C or other, stuff, other things outside of of these two things. And that's a bit more difficult to understand what exactly that means and what the consequences are, so you don't have to absolutely subscribe to it right now, but if I explain it like this, I think it sounds also reasonably convincing that we might want this. It, that it's, not, it's not a bad idea to, to try to do that. And then what he was able to prove is that if I want these two properties, if I also want to be able to deal with three or more alternatives, with two it works, but if I want to deal with three or more, well, then I can do this, but I can only do it if the aggregation mechanism that I'm going to implement isn't really an aggregation mechanism, but it's a dictatorship. Dictatorship in the following sense. Dictatorship here means that there will be one fixed individual called a dictator, and the aggregation rule, all that it's going to do is will copy that person's preference order into the output. So that, that kind of uh, mechanism does have these properties, right? It's unanimous. If everybody says A is better than B, so does the dictator, so therefore, uh, we, we're going to do what the dictator says, so we're going to do what, uh, what, uh, what everybody says. It's also uh, independent because um, it just matters what uh, the dictator says about A versus B. It doesn't matter what 
anybody says about C. So it also has this property. And then the difficult, interesting, surprising, and weird thing in that theorem is that the other direction also works. That if I want these properties, yeah, I can do that, but I must implement a dictatorship. So that's the negative result. And again, it didn't kill the area. It started it, and people just started thinking, OK, we have to do other things. We have to change uh, you know, conditions a little bit to do something with this. So this is to give you a bit of an idea of uh, what classical social choice theory is in 1951. And uh, he got a Nobel Prize 20 years later, not exactly about this, but about similar things. So it, it has been a very, very important area in economics, maybe peaking in the 70s. And then people lost a little bit interest for a while. But uh, in the 90s, and certainly in the noughties, people in computer science got very interested in these kinds of, kind of ideas. And why is that? Uh, let me first explain it from the practical side. Um, so some of these ideas of collective decision making in a kind of principled way, they are in interesting for some problems, practical problems in computer science. Maybe the best known example is um, Google search engines on the internet. So um, let me first give the, the, the well, let me first explain the complicated version, how, it's, how, it's, how social choice theory is used there. So suppose a link on a website to another website, you think of this as a vote of that website for the other website saying that's somehow important. Uh, and then if you're looking at the internet as a whole and you're looking which website is pointing at which other website with a link and therefore says this is some importance for me, it's a little bit like an election. So the principles that people have used to design voting rules, social choice rules, they should also play a, ro a role in, in the design of search engines. And of course, in reality, it was the other way around that Google, the Google people first had, had this idea and later people formalized this in terms of social choice uh, terminology but it's still helpful to understand what's going on there. And the more obvious thing is if you want to write a meta search engine, you might get the uh, orderings that Google and Yahoo and Microsoft and so on get you, and you want to aggregate them just as I've aggregated the orderings of these experts before to get an overall ordering of the meta search engine and have somehow a better result there. So again, I'm using some ideas of social choice theory. I could use some ideas of social choice theory. Another application are recommender systems. So you look at some users in the past, what they bought, and therefore what kind of preferences they have, and you try to aggregate this information to make some recommendations for, for new people of what they should maybe buy. Uh, uh, and then the last one is multi-agent systems. So uh, you have maybe different robots or other intelligent uh, agents. They all have their own information and goals and strategies and so on, and we have to somehow uh, aggregate this information from these different agents to together come to a cooperative solution to some really difficult problem. So again, some principles of social choice might be useful in doing this. So this is one of the reasons why people got interested in this field. Maybe this is the reason why people got originally interested in this field in computer science. And then it, something happened that kind of people actually, most of the work is now going the other way around, that people used fundament, fundamental methods of computer science to say something interesting about social choice theory. And that's really where, what most of the field is about right now. There's a, a, a handbook chapter that we've written last year that has come out uh, this year. So there it is labeled as being part of multi-agent systems. But other communities should feel free to claim this for themselves as well. And this is a bit of an introduction to these various areas. And I want to show some of them you, uh, some of these to you now. Uh, with one slide, just as an example of how um, people have used logic, and the, say, uh, the paper cited there is one of mine, but there are quite a few other things uh, as well. So one interesting question is, what kind of logic do I need to speak about these kind of problems, like Arrow's theorem? How, what features do I need? So uh, for example, this IIA, this independence thing, is quite a complicated uh, condition, right? It says, well, if you're going to you know, make this decision in this situation, in another possible world where the preferences are maybe slightly different, it says something about what decision you should make there. So this maybe suggests that some more logic would be interesting to deal with these kind of things. And some people have done that. Uh, in, this in this paper, we looked into can we use first order logic, classical first order logic, to talk about this. And I'm not going to explain really what this is about. Just one of the theorems looks like this. It's, we, there's some formulas that form a theory. It's called T arrow. And then the theorem says that this first order theory does not have a finite model. And then the claim is that this basically is a rendering of Arrow's theorem. And so the meta insight here is that, yes, we can say most things that are interesting about Arrow's theorem in first order logic. The one thing that we cannot say is that the set of voters 
has to be finite, which I didn't mention before, that detail, but it doesn't, it's not actually true if there's an infinite set of folders. And so that's exactly what you cannot say in first order logic. So it kind of is interesting to tell us exactly what are the boundaries of these kind of results, so just as an example. Uh, of course, once you have this kind of theoretical work, you might also do more practical things. You might want to use automated theorem provers to reprove some of these results. You might go further and you want to automatically search for new results, maybe varying these axioms a little bit. So Arrow Theorem, how it was published uh, 60 years ago, it was wrong for the first 10 years, so there were some little mistakes in the axioms. And maybe they would have found them if they had uh, tried an automated theorem prover back then, I'm not sure, but uh, certainly now we can be quite sure that this is correct. And amongst other things, it has been verified by people in the automated theorem proving community. But it's quite difficult if we change the axioms a little bit to understand what exactly the consequences are and these kind of tools, they might be useful for that. Uh, model checking might also be an interesting uh, method uh, to use to check, for example, there has been a little bit of work checking some particular implementations of some complicated voting rules, whether they really have the properties that are claimed to have, and sometimes people found they don't, and how that should be fixed, and so on. So this is one direction. Um, for the other direction that I want to explain to you, I have to first show you this example. It's uh, about voting, about strategic behavior in voting. So maybe some of you remember in 2000, there was an election in the United States for the president. And particularly in Florida, it was quite interesting what happened. And I've simplified here a little bit. So suppose it was like this. So for example, 49% of the people thought that Bush was better than Gore, who was better than Nader. And let's say they also voted like this. Uh, and suppose you know, no ballots were disappearing or people were barred from voting or anything like this. So we are scientists. We are allowed to abstract away from reality. So that's what I'm going to do here. So suppose it was really like this. Who's going to win the election if it's like that? You say Bush is one correct answer. What's the other correct answer? Depends, because I didn't yet say what voting rule we're going to use. So if we're using what people do use in the United States, the plurality rule, which just looks at who do you think is the best and actually ignores everything that comes afterwards, and indeed Bush is going to win with 49 points against 40 for Gore and 11 for Nader. So this is correct. Bush will win. Um, Second question down there, what would your advice to the NADA supporters have been? Suppose they had, you had known this and you could have advised them of, on, on how to vote. What should they have done? Because they got a really bad outcome. They got the worst possible outcome for themselves. Vote, vote for goal. Yeah, lie. Lie about your preferences and pretend that you think that goal is best. And then if nobody else does change their, changes their mind at least, then Gore will win the election with 51 against 49. And maybe they should have done that and would have saved everyone a, a lot of trouble. And some people have blamed the NADA voters for not having done this kind of thing. And maybe it would have helped, uh, self saved everyone a lot of trouble. But of course, maybe it's not fair to, to blame these people for that. Because what we should really blame is the voting rule, right? The voting rule forced people to decide, some people in some situations, forces them to decide should I be honest and say what I really want? Or should I be kind of result driven and get the best thing I, put, I can in the given situation, given the information that I have, and lie and get a better outcome? And it would be better if there were voting rules that don't give us this, this problem. So maybe we have to change the voting rule and vote in a different way so that people don't have this, this kind of dilemma. Uh, and then the interesting thing is that there was another big theorem it's called the gibbard satisfied theorem. It's just paraphrased the phrase there in the first two lines that says, uh, it was in 1972 that the, this was proven for the first time. It says, this is impossible. You cannot design a voting rule that will never put the people into that situation where they have to decide, should I be honest or should I be goal driven? Uh, and the, the ideas behind it are somewhat similar to, to Arrow's theorem, why this is impossible. Um, the only way uh, how I can make it possible again is to implement a dictatorship in the same way as for error, which is not what we want uh, in an election, obviously. So in that sense, it's impossible. Um, okay, so it's impossible. And then uh, again, you could stop there or you could try off ways around that. And one way around that came from, from computer science. Uh, a possible way around that, and I will say in a minute why it's only maybe a possible way around it. So suppose, yes, okay, it's possible, it's always possible that there are situations where people will have uh, an incentive to manipulate, but maybe we can make it really, really difficult. Really, really difficult as in NP hard. 
So if that were possible, if you could find a voting rule where you can manipulate in theory, because the theorem says that will not be possible to avoid that, but it's, it's so hard that you cannot do that in a reasonable amount of time, then maybe that in practice will, will save us from people manipulating in elections. And uh, this doesn't work for a lot of voting rules. It doesn't work for the simple uh, plurality rule that is actually used. It's very easy to manipulate that one computationally. But it does work for some other rules. So it works, for example, for the uh, single transferable vote rule that is used in Australia. So that one is NP hard to manipulate in this sense. So that's a nice thing. It also works for some rules that people have constructed for the purpose of doing something that is hard. So that's quite nice that you can have, at least in theory, this kind of computational protection against bad behavior. It's a little bit like cryptography in this sense that uh, you know, you, the computational hardness is actually something that you want here. You want bad behavior to be really difficult to be executed. In practice, now people realize it's not really a protection. I mean, uh, NP-hard just means in the worst case. And um, you know, maybe the examples, hardness is usually in the number of candidates. The number of candidates for many applications, like real world elections, is quite small. So in that sense, it doesn't, it doesn't really help in practice. But it still says, tells us something interesting in theory. And what people have been working on since then is notions of average complexity. So can we say something interesting about this? Parameterized complexity to understand exactly where does the hardness come from if it, if it is there and these kind of things. And people have looked at many other problems and studied the computation complexity. So for example, there are other ways of, of, being, of having bad behavior in an election. For example, bribery. The question is, uh, you know, if every voter has a certain price, if I want that to flip their preferences uh, and I have 100 euros, do I have enough money so that I can change some people's votes such that I get the election outcome that I want? I would like this to, to be computationally difficult to do, and in some cases, it is computationally difficult to do that. Uh, also, for some rules, um, I might be interested in just uh, how difficult is it to compute the winner of the election. In the plurality rule and the most simple rules, it's very easy, but in some rules, it's actually NP hard or even worse to just compute the winner of the election, and we would like to understand that better, and we want to use for example, parameterized complexity to understand exactly where the problem is and this kind of thing. So that's a, that's a big industry right now. Um, and the one of the first papers with these kind of ideas, particularly about manipulation, is this one by Bartoldi, Tobey, and Trick. Uh, and uh, one of the recent overviews is by Faliszewski, Hemas Panda, and Hemas Panda, where you can read a bit about this kind of thing. So this is a very easy reading one in the communications of the ACM. OK, next topic. Um, this is the one that has to do with the combinatorial domains. So suppose we have an election where we're not going to vote just for a president, but we have to decide on several issues. Like in California or in Switzerland, they have these elections where, where you have to say for a number of things, yes or no. And in America, it's usually about abortion and gay marriage and, and, uh, and this kind of thing. So you have, to, you have several things that you have to, have to say yes or no on. So let's say there are three of them uh, in this example. And suppose there are 13 voters who have to vote on each of these. And let's say it looks like this. So this means, for example, that there are three people who said yes on the first question and no on the other two questions. And then there are three more who said yes for the middle question and no for the first and for the third one, and so on. Uh, and most of the options are explored. Just nobody says no, no, no. Just so happens. Who's, uh, so which combination will win this election? Again, it depends on what rule we're going to use. What everybody uses in the real world is the issue-wise uh, simple majority rule. So that is, means that for each issue, I would check is the majority for yes or for no, and then I'm going to lock in that value, and I'm going to run, go on to the next one. So for example, for the first issue, there are three people up there who say yes in the first row, and then there is four, five, six people who say yes. And then it should be seven who say no. Let's just quickly check. So there are three plus three is six. And then there's a seventh person here who says no. So it's seven to six saying no. And it's a symmetric example, as you have maybe seen already. So it will be the same for each of the three. So actually, for each of the three issues, there will be a small majority saying no. So we get no, no, no as the outcome. And that's a bit weird. And in the paper that contains that example, they call it a paradox. Because that's actually the one combination that nobody chose, so that had the lowest support, is the winning one. So what can we do? And that's a whole field by now. What can we do about this? This is this uh, collective choice in combinatorial domains. 
well, it's a computer science issue, as I'm just trying to hint there with the last paragraph on this slide, is that, I mean, our voting mechanism was treating it issue by issue, but when I explained what the problem is, I kind of forgot about this, and I looked at it in a global way, and I actually said there are eight meta issues, two to the power of three, and of these combinations, I'm really caring about those, and I'm, I'm, I'm explaining why there's a problem at that level of abstraction. So uh, that's also maybe you know, why, yeah, why it is a paradox that we're kind of voting in one way, we're voting locally, but then globally we're talking about it and wondering what's happening. And the problem is, of course, that uh, we could maybe try to vote directly on these eight options, and for this example, of course, we can somehow solve it if we want to. Um, but the issue is that if I have n issues, then I have two to the n of these combinations, and even if I have a voting rule that I like, in other terms, I will have just too much data to, to work with at some point. I have to think of clever ways of representing even the preferences of the individual people participating in this election, this kind of thing. So I have knowledge representation issues, and you can imagine what kind of community would want to, to talk about these kind of things. So maybe you've heard of CP nets. It's a big thing in AI in knowledge representation right now. So this is used a lot uh, in that field to talk about these things, and other languages uh, to represent these kind of preferences. Um, so I don't have a solution for you right now. I'm just putting this here as a problem and telling you that somehow it has to do with representation of preferences that we have to attack this. But what I want to do in the last part, in the well, second half of the talk, is talk a bit more about why is that actually a paradox, what we just saw there? And why did I also call the Condorcet paradox a paradox? Uh, and things like this. So why paradox? And to, uh, to warm up, I want to show you two more examples um, for this kind of paradox. It will always be the same story, but we're trying to see some general structure in here. So this is something called judgment aggregation maybe also of interest for people who, who like logic. So here, we're not talking about preferences, but we're talking about judgments. So the story in this one is there are three judges. They have to decide whether the defendant should go to prison, whether Q is true. That's the one on the right-hand side that, is, that really matters. And there are two things they have to decide on. First, P, that's something about the fingerprints there on the door handle, whether it's really those are the fingerprints of the defendant. Uh, and P implies Q. Um, would mean something like, well, if these are his fingerprints, then he is guilty and he should go to prison. So suppose we have talked about a lot of stuff already as judges, and we are now down to these few simple questions. Are these his fingerprints? Is the fingerprints being his a sufficient condition for putting him into a jail, and should we put him into jail? These are the three questions that still remain to be asked, to, to be answered. And maybe the most important one is the last one, should he go to jail, yes or no? And you can have different opinions about this, because it's not completely obvious, but as a judge, you should at least be internally consistent. And the good thing is that they are. So the first judge, for example, thinks that all of these formulas are true. That's consistent in classical propositional logic. That's fine. You can say that P is true, that P implies Q, and that Q is true. The second guy has different opinions, but he's also internally consistent. So he says that P is true. He does not believe that P implies Q, so it's perfectly fine for him to say that Q is false. And the last one says that he doesn't believe that P is true. He would believe that P implies Q if that were relevant, but because P is not true, it's not relevant, so it's perfectly consistent for him to say that Q is false. So each of them is logically consistent. How do we aggregate this information to decide what to do? Any suggestions? So what matters is whether he goes to prison. Yes? There are two suggestions. You have two suggestions. OK, let's, let's start with one of them. One of them is take majority rule on the premises. Yeah. The other one is take majority rule on the conclusions. Exactly. So that's indeed the issue. So either we could take the majority on the conclusions. That's what I was just kind of trying to hint at. Conclusion is Q. There are two people uh, saying that's false. So there's a majority saying this is false. So you should not put him to prison. Or, and that's the first option that you mentioned, we should go by the premises. So we first aggregate on P, there's a majority in favor. Then on the implication, there's a majority in favor. So we have P, we have P implies Q, then we know, use logic and we know that P is true. If P implies Q, then Q is true. So we have two rules that are quite reasonable. And I always confuse that. So one is the British way of doing it and one is the American way of doing it. I can never remember and I never remember to look it up before a talk. 
But so there's either this kind of premise-based approach, we look at all the, we should look at all the evidence, uh, agree on the evidence, and then it's clear from, you know, the case, from, from previous cases, how to react to this evidence. Or every judge should ponder the evidence by themselves, come up with an opinion about the conclusion, and we vote on the conclusion. And in this case, we will get two different outcomes. There's a, third, there's a second way how to explain the problem. Uh, and if I just dis don't distinguish between premises and conclusions, which is also you know, nice, maybe because we don't see those, this feature really in the formulas. If I just use majority rule in every, every column, I get a true here, I get a true here, and I get a false here. So I get a set of formulas here that's not logically consistent anymore. Right? P is true, P implies Q is true, but Q is false. So even though every individual was logically consistent, the majority is not logically consistent. So that version I want you to keep in mind. Yes? The judge three. Okay. So judge three says that uh, he believes in P implies Q, and he um, he doesn't believe P or he, and he doesn't believe Q. So false implies false in classical proposition logic is true. So if you if you know your truth tables, then you you can explain it like this, or in everyday language, well. He does believe the implication, but he doesn't even believe that this is true, so actually the implication doesn't fire, so he can do whatever he likes here, and it's consistent to say that he says it's false. There was still another question. Yeah? yeah. Uh, are you also wondering? So he could, yeah, so it would also be consistent to have somebody who says false, true, true. Yeah, it would be consistent. Yes, so it's just, I'm just saying, I, I was just saying it's consistent. I was not saying, so, you know, it was, he thought about the two premises. He realized that didn't force him to do anything, so he thought, some more and he just somehow, we don't know exactly what he did, he came up with this. The only thing that we can check is that he was logically consistent. There are other examples that are slightly less pretty maybe, but that, that avoid, so for example, you could have A, B and the conjunction of A and B. Then you don't have any of this issue, everything is forced, I don't, I don't have to, you know, hand wave so much, but the story is exactly the same. Yeah. Okay, so. Three people saying something that's logically consistent, we use majority, we end up with something that's not logically consistent. That's the part I want you to keep in mind. One more example, the last one, uh, it's very similar, a bit simpler than the one with the three issues before with the 13 people saying yes, no, yes, and these kind of things. So we are sitting with the three of us in the city council and we have to decide whether we're going to give money to the new museum, to the new school, or to the new metro line. And we all know and we all accept, and it's clear, there's money for at most two of these projects, but we have different preferences about which projects to fund. The first of us says, I want to fund the museum and the school, but then not the metro. The second one says, I want to fund the museum and the metro, but not the school. And the third one says, not the museum, but the school and the metro. So each one of them respects this integrity constraint of there being a limitation on the amount of money available. But how could we aggregate this kind of information? You know it by now. If we use the majority rule issue by issue, what are we going to get? We're going to get a majority for yes, a majority for yes, and a majority for yes. So it will be yes, 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 and we're going to bankrupt the whole, the whole thing. Okay, so another paradox. Now, what's the general structure of these paradoxes? I could have translated them all into this kind of sequence of yes, no questions, and only the last one I really showed you exactly in that form uh, already. So for example, at the very initial example about the preference aggregation with the red and the blue and the yellow circles, I could have cut it down into questions like, do you rank red above blue? Do you rank yellow above, ye above blue? And this kind of things. And then people would answer yes or no to this, and I can I can aggregate. And you can imagine if I had translated it into this form, I would have somehow gotten the same result, right? It's a, it's a faithful translation. For the judgment aggregation with the formulas and with the defendant and the judges, I basically asked people, you know, do you believe in the truth of this formula, yes or no? 
and I asked this a few times for various formulas, and I somehow aggregated this information. In the last example, I asked things like, do you want to give money to the school? Do you want to give money to the new metro line? And people said yes or no. And then for each of them, there was an integrity constraint. And in the last example, I made that integrity constraint explicit with the money, with the constraint on the money. And the other examples, it was implicit. And I left it out in my initial explanation. So for example, in the preference aggregation, it's, it was that each of these rankings should really be a proper linear order. It should be transitive and complete and uh, irreflexive. And I didn't really say that when I first told you the story, but everybody kind of implicitly knew that's what I meant. Um, for the judgment aggregation, I made it a little bit more explicit already. I said, well, everybody should give me a logically consistent set of formulas. And I also want a logically consistent set of formulas in the outcome. So my integrity constraint was whatever combination of yes or no you're going to give me, it should, if I translate it back into the formula kind of world, it should be logically consistent. And in the last one, the integrity constraint was we only have money for at most two projects. So if I have this terminology in place, I can now define what I really mean by paradox as the following thing. A paradox uh, is a situation where I use an aggregation rule, such as the majority rule, which is the one I used in all of these examples, where I have this integrity constraint in the background, and I can find an example where the integrity constraint is satisfied by every individual, but after using the aggregation rules, for example, majority rule, I end up with something at the collective level that does not satisfy the integrity constraint anymore. So a paradox is now defined as the failure to lift an integrity constraint from the individual to the collective level. And we have seen that the majority rule does not lift uh, certain types of integrity constraints from the individual to the collective level. For example, none of those three that we've listed there. And one interesting question that I didn't put on the slides is, what do they all have in common? And what they all have in common, I'm just going to say it like this now, is they can all be written as clauses with three or more literals. Actually, the interesting ones are those with exactly three literals. Just something for you to think about. OK. Simpler question is, um, well, suppose I have a certain type of integrity constraint. What kind of rule do I have to design if I want to make sure there's no paradox so it will lift successfully? And um, I could ask this for a very concrete aggregation rule and a very concrete integrity constraint. A bit more interesting is if I ask it for classes of constraints and for classes of rules. And there's one very simple result here from the paper cited at the bottom that says, uh, that equates the following two things. So first I'm going to tell you what unanimity is. And you saw this already for Arrow's theorem. I have to slightly reformulate it for this binary aggregation framework. It just means if there's an issue that everybody agrees on, let's say that it should be yes, then it will be yes. And if everybody agrees on it should be no, then it will be no. In all other cases, if there's a 99% majority, I don't know. The rule might make different choices based on whatever. But in those very, very extreme cases where everybody completely agrees, the unanimity property is satisfied if my rule always guarantees that this unan un unanimity will be carried over. And the result says that an aggregator is unanimous if and only if it will lift any kind of integrity constraint that can be expressed as a conjunction of literals. So for example, yeah, if conjunction of, so you can imagine how it can define a logical language over this kind of thing. So the propositional variables will be related to these issues. And then the conjunction would be, for example, P and not Q. So it would, be say, would say everybody should respect that P must be true and Q must be false. Um, and then this result just says that exactly any kind of constraint I can express with conjunctions of literals will be lifted, will not cause paradoxes, if and only if it's a unanimous rule. It's a very simple result when you understand the definition. It's just the rewriting of the definitions. You don't have time to understand the definitions. It doesn't matter. But what I want to tell you is what I like about this is that it connects two very different worlds. So this is the very basic world of logic that's at the syntactic level. And this is a very fundamental principle in economics, saying that if everybody says we should do this, we should do it. You know, the Pareto uh, idea, if for those of you who know about these kind of things. So what I like about this kind of results is they connect these two very different worlds and say there is actually a connection between of them. And technically, it does it in a very simple way. Yes? Just to clarify, any example in which uh, uh, the integrity constraints can't be expressed uh, in this For example, if I want to use it to model, um, well, the simplest example is the one with the projects, with the constraints. 
So it just said you are not allowed to put P and Q and R, but you allowed everything else. I cannot write this in a positive way of what's allowed as an integral constraint using only conjunction and negation inside. Yeah. Okay. Um, so suppose now, so for, for every integrity constraint, I will have some paradoxes. Can I find an aggregator that avoids all paradoxes, that I don't have to worry about this kind of stuff anymore? And the answer is yes, I can, but I have to limit myself quite a bit. And what it says is an aggregator will lift any kind of integrity constraint that you could possibly think of, if and only if. It is what I'm going to call here a generalized dictatorship. And a generalized dictatorship is defined as follows. It's defined by a function g. And that function g takes as input the whole profile, everything that these voters do. You can look at any detail of what they're doing, no limitations. But in the output, it has to be the name of one of the voters. And then the rule will copy that person's vote, that person's ballot, that person's vector of zeros and ones. So for example, this includes the real dictatorships in the sense of arrow that we saw at the very beginning. The real dictatorships are those where I'm fixing in advance whose ballot I'm going to copy. And it does not actually depend on the profile. So these are very bad rules. We don't like them. So this class includes some really bad rules we don't, that we don't like. But it also includes some quite potentially interesting rules. At this point, I just want to say potentially interesting. So for example, we could do something we could compute the majority issue-wise. We'll get something that maybe is going to violate our integrity constraint. But then we can look amongst all the individuals who is closest in a kind of humming distance uh, way, for example, to this majority vector. Or we kind of make that guy the local dictator for this particular instance of the election and return this ballot. Or we could kind of take averages over all the individual vectors and kind of pick the one individual that is closest in a humming sense to this average vector. Might be another way of, of doing a compromise. So this looks a bit more promising. And then the last uh, thing I want to show you is that this actually, I think, is, these are actually not so bad rules. They are very simplistic. They may be not appropriate in all scenarios, but they actually have surprisingly good properties. We're, go, go, we're calling them the majority voter rule and the average voter rule. So majority voter rule says, Look at what the majority would say. That might, that might be something that doesn't make any sense in the application domain because it violates the integrity constraint. But then pick the voter who is closest to this majority vector and copy his input into the output. So as we've seen already in the previous result, these rules, they will never give us a paradox because the output will be something that was one of the inputs. If we assume that every guy who votes is themselves consistent, we are by definition consistent in the outcome. That's all it says. It has quite low complexity because we only have to search through the n voters what they did and we have to pick one of them. So unless we have some really crazy function, which these are not, uh, that decides how to pick, there can never be any serious complexity in there. The majority one is slight, has slightly lower complexity, but both are so low that it maybe doesn't really matter very much. If we do think that what matters is somehow the distance of the outcome to the profile, so if I'm computing the humming distance to every single, I've decided on my outcome, I'm computing the humming distance to every single voter, and I add that up, and that's somehow, if that's a big number, that's bad. If that's a small number, that's better. I could use as a rule, like, find me the consistent outcome that minimizes this sum of humming distance, but then I have something that's probably worse than NP hard. Uh, so maybe I don't want to do that. But then these rules, there are two approximations of this idea rule that, 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 that uh, minimizes over all possible ways of doing it. So in some cases, that would be good enough for me. So that's, that's, that's a good thing. And these rules satisfy quite a few uh, classical social choice theoretic axioms for those of you who know about these things. So unanimity, we've seen already. I have not explained anonymity and neutrality. Anonymity means that all the voters are treated symmetrically. Neutrality means that all the issues are treated symmetrically. Um, so these things are satisfied. Independence is one of the classical axioms that is not satisfied. So that's, that's the one thing that it can't satisfy. And one of these rules also satisfies a rule called reinforcement, which says that if I'm splitting the electorate into two groups and let them both do their own little election, and if so happens, they come up with the same winning outcome, 
then also if I put them together in a single election, this thing should be the winning outcome. Surprisingly, some classical voting rules, they don't satisfy this property. One of ours here satisfies it, the other one doesn't. And many rules actually don't satisfy it. So the fact that it does satisfy it is also a nice thing in favor of this rule. Yeah. Yes. First, you. No, no, it's not. So it's a quite strong requirement, partly because of what you just said. Yeah. Yes, maybe. So, but of course, I don't know this in advance. So maybe, I mean, uh, I shouldn't, so probably I shouldn't say, uh, well, it, it, could be, it could be a rule that says, let's try to get the majority. And if that's fine, if that's not contradicting our integrity constraints, then we leave it like this. And if it's not fine, we move to copying the next person's. Uh, that would be a possible rule, yes. Yes, I, maybe I don't find it so pretty because it's kind of mixing different principles, but, uh, but in practice, this might be what you want to do sometimes. It does not contradict my theorem. It does not contradict my theorem because I can do this, like checking whether it's okay, and if it's not okay, move, once I know the integrity constraint. But if I want to be, you know, if I don't know in advance which integrity constraint is going to be, I can, for every example, I can find you one integrity constraint where you would have to move. That's why the theorem is correct. But for any concrete integrity constraint, I might, I have a larger space of rules available, including the one that you mentioned. But if I don't, if I want the same mechanical way of doing it work for any integrity constraint, there will always be some situation where I would have to switch. So intersection of all of them will be, I have to always switch if I never want to have this kind of problem. OK, let me conclude. Last slide. Uh, what I try to do is explain a little bit what this field of computational social choice is about. So the basic idea is social choice theory is like game theory, like decision theory, a field in economics. So decision theory is more about how do I myself decide what my utility function should be, what my preferences should be. Game theory is about there is me and an opponent, or me against nature, how do I strategize, what should I do? And social choice is looking from above there. All these different people have to make their decisions, strategizing, how do I organize the whole space so that I get a socially attractive outcome? Uh, and it's, a, it's an interesting field. Uh, you know, people win Nobel Prizes, used to win Nobel Prizes for this kind of thing. It has a lot to say about, you know, it's relevant to not just economics, but to philosophy, political science, and so on. So it's a, uh, mathematicians have worked on this for more than 50 years. So it's, a, it's an interesting field, but only in the last 10 years or so, it really seriously entered computer science. Uh, one reason is because of some applications. Uh, that's what we always put on our first slide. And then the real reason is that there are really interesting technical theoretical problems in social choice theory that we can study with our methods. And I've given you some examples. I have mentioned briefly how we can use logic to model some of these uh, problems. And I had this example with using first or logic for error theorem. I've uh, explained how computational complexity theory might be useful to inform us about voting. For example, how hard is it to manipulate an election, something we don't want to happen, so maybe we can make it really, really difficult computationally. I have hinted at the fact that if you have these multi-issue multi elections where you have to decide on several issues at a time, I have this kind of combinatorial explosion. So I don't just have the choice theoretic challenges of classical social choice theory, but I have algorithmic challenges that go with it. And I have to somehow find a good compromise between these two pulling and pushing forces. Uh, and at the end, uh, I've shown you in this area of uh, combinatorial domains, in this case, binary domains, some way of characterizing in a new way the rules that work fine and that don't cause paradoxes. And that we can say interesting things about this using a kind of language of talking about these things that is closer, I would say, to computer science and logic than uh, what is happening in economic theory. So it's maybe not surprising that these kind of results happen in this community, even though they are relevant to the original community as well. Computational social choice, Comstock, is a booming field. It's, uh, it's very, very active. There are, there are many people working on this. Uh, and there are many things still to be done. So it's still young enough that nobody can tell you this doesn't count as computational social choice. So if you have something that you like in computation uh, and you have ideas how to combine them, for now this is still okay and people will not immediately say, no, 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 this doesn't belong here. So people 
are very much encouraged to think about these things. One starting point is this website, uh, which happens to be hosted in Amsterdam, but it's meant to be a general thing about the community. So for example, you can find the first 20 or so PhD theses uh, in this area that uh, can download them from there. You can find announcements about the biannual workshop in computational social choice, some special issues about journals uh, and these kind of things, and the mailing list with job announcements and conference announcements and these kind of things. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, thanks, uh, great talk. Um, questions? Here you described uh, three types of paradoxes I mentioned. So then I said a uh, rule or method how to avoid that uh, paradoxes, all paradoxes. But uh, how do you know, uh, is there another paradoxes? So maybe there are another paradoxes yet that you don't know about. Uh, how you say that you can eliminate all paradoxes? Thank you. Yeah, so I, I, I was able to prove a theorem about avoiding all paradoxes by defining what I mean by paradox and just avoiding those, of course. But the thing, this is not just a matter of uh, uh, creative definitions, but it so happens that really almost everything in the literature that is called a paradox somehow fits in there. I have to qualify this a little bit for the people who know about it. It, it works. Um, this kind of way of looking at it works if you have aggregation problems where the input things look like the output things. So in preference aggregation, you get a preference in, you get a preference out. It doesn't apply to voting theory because you get a preference in and you get the name of the winner out. So that, that thing is a big field. It doesn't fit here, but preference aggregation fits, judgment aggregation fits, uh, all sorts of variants of judgment aggregation, binary aggregation, and quite a few different uh, paradoxes that have been written about in very different parts of the literature do fit in that. So it's a reasonably large class of paradoxes, but of course the theorem only applies to what I defined, and if tomorrow you have an interesting paradox that doesn't fit, then somebody else has to prove a different theorem. Yes. Thank you.